Uh, we'll, let's just start right there. Um, rather than the, you know, tell us about yourself, first story, I want to talk about the idea of a pastor. You're, you're a business guy who became a pastor, not the other way around. So I want to, maybe we start there. What does that mean? What is, well, I think yeah. part of it is that people see things so segmented, yeah. you know, and if you're a, a husband and a father and an employer or an employer and they're all segmented, you're probably living a really broken life. Yeah. And you need to really live an integrated life. I didn't grow up in religion. I didn't grow up in church. I grew up irreligious. I didn't have anything against religion. I just didn't have anything for it. And my mom studied Buddhism and then became Jewish and uh, was uh, born into a Roman Catholic world. And so we went on a spiritual roller coaster the whole time growing up. I became a philosopher in college. Um, I would have never said I was an atheist. I would have said I was a mystic. Okay. I believe there was more than the material world, but I didn't know what was sure. there. And and it was always searching. I mean, I, I, I my earliest memories of searching for God were probably when I was six, seven years old, mm. and um, and really desperately trying to figure out if there's any meaning to my life. Yeah. And you know, and so when I became a person of faith, when I had a life-changing uh, encounter with Jesus, I didn't know being a pastor was a career. I thought it was just an expression of your passion and calling and gifts and talents. I, did, I didn't know I could communicate, yeah. and no one knew I could, could communicate. Could you communicate then? And like, uh, strangely oh. enough, I could. Okay. I didn't know I could. Yeah. I, I was super shy, incredibly okay. introverted, uh, really socially uh, 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 reclusive. Yeah. And I lived in my inside world. I was in a psychiatrist uh, office by the time I was 12 years old, mm. in and out of hospital for six months. And I was so introverted that I just didn't know how to interact with people in the outside world. And, um, and I had relatives who didn't even know, I mean, they would joke with me, can you talk? Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I could be silent for three, four days without even, even realizing I hadn't said a word. And so when I became a person of faith, and now I've discovered something that has given me meaning in life, I, for the first time, had something to say, I yeah. felt like. Uh, something I wanted to talk about. And, um, and, I, and I think that's where, for me, communication became really essential. Um, I wasn't a person that needed to be on a stage. Yeah. I was a person that was happy to talk to a person one-on-one, -on -one, and that seemed to work really well, and then it went to one-on-10, one-on-100, one-on-1,000, one-10,000, one one-hundred-thousand, and it just kept expanding. But for me, I was always just talking to one person. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm a, I've been a pastor, but I've never called myself that as a career, yeah. and I, or nor my core identity. Um, my core identity is, you know, that I'm Irwin. Yeah. You know, I have a relationship with God, and I'm here to create and make the world better. And it can be through art, it can be through film, it can be through fashion, it can be through uh, starting Mosaic, our church here in Los Angeles, or it can be through working with, you know, elite performers yeah. in the business world. And it's all the same to me. It's all just an expression of life. Do you get a lot of pushback, or whether online or in person, of like, well, you, you, you know, you shouldn't be focused on money. You shouldn't be focused on business. You're about God. You should be doing that only. Like, do you get that criticism at all? Of course. Okay. And I realize most of those people are um, ironically Christians. Mm, yeah, yeah. People who are not Christians never have a problem with it. <laughs> <laughs> it makes sense to them. Yeah. People who are Christians want to tell you who you should be. And I always think to myself, wow, did those people actually read the Bible? Mm. You know, because... Um, Joseph actually became the most powerful man yeah. and, uh, in, in an empire that was um, anti-God. Yeah. And so did Daniel, and Moses became the, leader, the founder of a nation. Uh, when you look at people in the scriptures, especially the Old Testament, they all rose to massive prominence. Yeah. They actually had incredible wealth and power and influence. And uh, Solomon, who was considered the wisest man who ever lived, was also the wealthiest um, Israelite who ever lived. Yeah. And God didn't seem to have any conflict yeah. between uh, living a life that he called him to live and living a life that created incredible wealth and, uh, and well-being for other people. Um, oh, the craziest thing is when I design clothes. Um, you know, there are a million people who make Christian t-shirts. Yeah. I make $10,000 jackets. Yeah. <laughs> There's a difference. And, uh, and, you know, and then you get all this criticism going, you know, why would you make a jacket that's so yeah. expensive? Yeah. You know, I mean, it's not accessible to all of us. And, yeah. you know, you're just going after whatever money. And I go, wait a minute. If I make a $30 t-shirt yep. to make money, I'm making money on people poorer than me. Yeah. If I mm. make a $500 jacket, I'm making money for people who are of my income. Yep. 
But if I'm making a $10,000 jacket, I'm actually pulling money from the wealthy yep. to pay for the work of people who are tailors and mm. sewers and pattern makers. People don't seem to understand how economy works. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and that's my biggest critique a lot of times with Christians is that a lot of the critique is really um, a, a, a huge amount of naivety about yeah. how the world actually works. Yeah. And so I actually make high end clothes because I didn't want anyone thinking as a pastor, I was trying to sell clothes to my constituency. Sure. Yeah. 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 No, no one at Mosaic can really can afford my clothes. And I love that. And, yeah. and also I, I have a particular sense of calling uh, to create things that are beautiful and elegant and extraordinary. Yeah. And so I don't really have any interest in creating things that are average. Yeah. I have a master class called Art of Communication. It's $5,000. Yeah. And, um, and of course, there's a lot of criticism, yep. you, you know, going, well, why don't you make it for $50? Yeah. And I go, because I do not create $50 products. Yeah. I just don't. Yeah. I, I wish I did because that would really scale. Yeah. It's the $50 product. It's the $250 product that actually scales. Yeah. The $5,000 one doesn't. It filters the person who's serious about becoming a world-class communicator. Yeah. And so I use it as a filter to find people who are determined to become the best. Mm. And that's pretty much what I do in everything I do. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. makes a lot of sense. You know, I, I used to be very against, I mean, like I, I do a lot of real estate, so I buy a bunch of real estate and I taught real estate on a podcast for a long time. And we like we were so, me and like the whole company, the podcast mm -hmm. was very anti, don't pay for education. Don't pay for <laughs> it, you can get it for free. But then I started noticing this pattern that everyone that I knew, almost everyone that I knew that paid a lot of money was way more successful. And it wasn't because they were <laughs> successful so they could afford it, which maybe was a piece of it, but mm -hmm. it's like they invested heavily and then those groups I saw just like, ridiculous levels of success. And so I've realized if I want to be in that, I got to maybe pay to get in that. Uh, and so it almost like self-selected a little bit. And there's still lots of stuff for everybody else to learn from. There's still yeah. like $30 t-shirts people can buy. No, and those are wonderful. Yeah. Except, you know, when people say that, I go, well, did you check the process of how yeah. it was made? Yeah. Like who didn't get paid so yep. that you wouldn't have to pay? Yes. Ooh, and that's a great question. Yeah. You see, when mm -hmm. I'm making something that's really expensive, I know everyone yeah. in our entire process yep. is being paid extremely well. Yeah. And so I don't mind charging the end consumer yeah. so that everyone else can have a really good livelihood. And I, I don't know why, but um, a lot of like faith yeah. thinking is is magical thinking. Mm -hmm. We just hope everything just happens yeah. magically and happens, you know, in a in an ethical way. You have to work to make things ethical. Yeah. And and that actually costs. Yeah. You know and. Uh, uh, yeah, and so I I, um, I I love Mosaic. Like, I don't have to pastor. Yeah. And I think, uh, in fact, when you see a lot of, like, I don't want to go with the, into that too much, but a lot of pastors who, who fall, yeah. um, a, lot of, a lot of church systems that yep. just collapse all around you, it's usually because their entire identity it's revolves around being the pastor mm -hmm. of a church, yeah. and their entire economy is. Yeah. And for me, uh, you know, for the first 30 years of pastoring, I don't think I ever made more than 30,000 a year. Yeah. And and that would be included entire package. You know, for yeah. the first 15 years I never made more than 16,000 a year. Yeah. And so it was more of a tip, you know, <laughs> and uh, and I lived in LA. Yeah. I had to work and I had to create yeah, well, I had to take care of my family and I'm really grateful for that. If I had a church that could have funded me yeah. and paid me whatever whatever it was worth, um, I don't think I would have had the hustle and the drive and the innovation and creativity to create other things. Yeah. And so I, I find that to be a great tension. I tell, usually I tell church starters when they're gonna go start a church, um, move to a place and start a career. Yeah, 100% agree. Yeah. Yeah. Get a job, yep. like do something that integrates you into yeah. the city. Don't get funded and then feel like you're gonna be relevant to that area. Yeah. Because everyone's gonna ask you, well, where are you getting your money? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I can say, hey, I do this, I do this, I do this. I, and, and it was so much fun, even starting Mosaic. Everyone knew I was a futurist. Yeah. And I got paid to be a futurist. And I would work with or universities and companies, organizations that um, I would come in and help them understand what was happening in the world and how to um, meet the future at its intersection. Yeah. And, it gave me so much credibility when I walked up on the platform and talked about Jesus because they knew I wasn't paid mm. to talk about God. Yeah. yeah, that's cool, man. Yeah, you know, there's this, uh, in a related way, the idea of building wealth. I get this criticism constantly, and I'm sure you do as well. Mm -hmm. And it's this idea, anytime I post on Instagram, I bought a new rental property. I get somebody, and they're always Christians, that'll say, when's enough enough, Brandon? Like, when is enough enough? Like, why do you need another property? Why do you need another apartment building or whatever? Like, launch some product. Why do you need another thing? Like, as if Christians are not 
supposed to have wealth. You know, you mm -hmm. mentioned Solomon, yeah. you mentioned all that. So how do you balance that? How do you balance, I like to create, and maybe there's a, I don't call it a game, but there's some, there's fun to creating something that then the world wants and then pays you money for, right? How do you balance that and that desire for wealth with also the fact that there's so much needy people out there? Like how, is, how do you do that and how do you advise people on that? Yeah, first of all, I think that we need to understand people are not the same. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not even a, a biblical idea that everyone um, was designed with the same gifts or talents or intelligence or ability or even energy. Yeah. We're all just different. Yeah. You know, when someone says, Brandon wins enough enough, you, you know, really the truth is it was already too much for them. Yeah, yeah. And they don't understand <clears throat> what drives you. And you can say, well, when there's no more poverty. Yes. Yeah. See, like when, when there's uh, no more need in the world, then enough will be enough. Yeah. But until then, I'm going to keep creating. Yeah. I'm going to keep generating, yeah. and and I'm going to keep being a generous person. And um, and then also there's also this other dynamic of there's just the the challenge. Yeah. You know, uh, there's a you know the big story in the Bible is about David killing Goliath, but then I think his four brothers were later killed. Yeah. There's only one verse on it. Because once one person kills a giant, <laughs> killing giants becomes normal. Yeah. And Brandon, what you're doing is you're killing giants. Yeah. And what, you're, what happens when you accomplish something and help someone else go, oh, if he can do that, I can do that. Mm. And I, I love being the person that proves that something can be done. Yeah. So I, I know when I started you know, 30, 40 years ago, no one thought pastors could be artists. Yeah. No, one, you know, no one was starting churches and nightclubs. <laughs> and no one was naming their churches just one word like mosaic. Yeah. Like all this stuff, I was considered a heretic, right? You know, and and then all now there's a whole generation of guys, pastors who are designing clothes, pastors who are um, musicians, pastors who are artists, pastors who are entrepreneurs, pastors who are creatives, and and I know I was seminal yeah. in that journey for them, uh, and they're better than me. Yeah. You know, I just <laughs> you know just because you're the first one doesn't mean you're the best one. Mm. And I knew so many times in my life that what I'm doing is not just to break me free. I'm doing it to break someone else free. Yeah, and when, you know when you when you sell one more house, um, when someone's going to sell that house, yeah, yeah, why shouldn't it be you? Yeah, right. Yeah. And, and what, what's the solution? Have someone who isn't generous, or someone yeah. who doesn't have faith, or someone who has really bad intention sell that house. Yeah, and it's so much better yeah. when it's a person who wants to live the life to make the world better. Yep. I want you to sell a lot of houses, you know, and I want God to expand your generosity. Yeah, and that to me is the better question. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And at the end of the day, like we can't take it with us anyway. So yeah. I think people get this idea that the wealthy people will just keep, keep collecting and it goes in the family. Maybe a lot of times it does. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your thoughts on like, where does your wealth go? Like assuming you continue to build wealth, you're smart with your money, you invest it by the time you're ready to pass away, you probably have a substantial chunk. Where does mm -hmm. that go? Your kids? Do you give it away somewhere else? What does that What's interesting like? is that people who are Christians and believe the Bible don't seem to believe the Bible when it says you should pass your wealth to generations to generations. Mm. That a wise man actually- Gives it to his kids. Yeah, passes on to children, yeah. grandchildren, grandchildren. I think it's perfectly biblical and actually incredibly healthy to pass things on to generations. Mm. And, and I, I, what are the options? Who gets your money? The government? Yeah. <laughs> right, and I'm going- Which for most people, that's the case. Yeah, right and now. I'm going, the last institution I would yeah. ever trust with my money <laughs> to do something meaningful with is the government. Yeah. And, 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 and so I'm going, okay, who, who am I going to give it to? Someone who is going to use it for their own greed? I, I, you're not supposed to just pass your money onto generations. You're supposed yeah. to pass your values. Yeah. And if you raise up a generation that's generous, that has integrity, yeah. that lives their life for the good, they're the ones you do want to entrust them with. The problem is when your kids become a trust fund kid. Yes. And they're yeah, entitled the and, egg, and, and they're, they don't express any positive ethics. Yeah. And then, you know, if you're only passing on your money, you're not passing on values and integrity and character and generosity, then you're destroying the generations to come. Yeah. And, but when, you know, when Solomon writes in Proverbs, he's actually talking about passing on wisdom mm -hmm. and passing on wealth. Yeah. And I, 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 I hope my great grandchildren get the benefit of the hard choices I make today. And the idea that the world should be um, equitable is not even a biblical concept. You know, when, when Jesus talks about in the parable of talents, he talks about one who's trusted with like five talents and, and uh, two talents and one talent, and he, you know, the master comes back and 
And what's interesting is one has five gets, you know, has 10, the one has uh, two gets five, and the one has one buries it and doesn't multiply it. And Jesus takes that one from the one who did nothing and didn't give it to the guy who had five Get to make them ten. more even. Yeah. He gave it to the guy mm. who had 10. Because what God cares about is who will multiply yeah. the benefit he gives you. He's not worried about keeping the scale even. Mm. And frankly, God should not entrust me with wealth if I will not do more good than someone else. Yeah. He should entrust someone else with it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. All right, so uh, let, let's shift. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the giving wealth away, but one segment of the show that we're trying to do mm -hmm. is uh, when we have sponsors on the show, which we're going to start having sponsors on the show, mm -hmm. paying ad revenue, we want to give all the ad revenue for each show away to a charity of the guest choosing. And uh, so the question for you is, what breaks your heart right now? Like what um, ministry, charity, group, cause do you care about that this show should generate profits to give to? Yeah, my wife Kim um, runs or leads all of our humanitarian projects around the world. And she's doing two things in one spot that I think are really significant. She's working in Malawi. And in fact, she's been there seven years. Mm. And last year, ended up meeting with the president of Malawi. Oh. And that's the level of influence her yeah. work there has had over the years. And there's a, one village we started working with, and there's about four months of the year where there's zero food in that village. So for the past five years, we've, as Mosaic, have invested $10,000 in that village and it gives them enough grain to not starve to death. Mm. And this year there is like a triangle of three different villages. So we're, um, we've been putting together $30,000 to help those. So that's one side of it. I'm going, uh, if, if someone felt passionate about just helping people in the most desperate situation, yeah. I would love for people to help that. Uh, we help them in that transitional period. We're also teaching them how to move toward uh, the kind of farming and agriculture that will eliminate that four month period. But until then, we don't want them to die. Yeah. And, and then at the same time, we, in that same village, um, we built the premier school for the whole country. It would cost us a million dollars and to hold 1600 kids and feed them every day. Mm. And we brought energy, electricity to that city, to that village for the first time in history yeah. with solar energy on that campus. And so right now we're building, um, facilities for the teachers because they live in, in slums. And so the teachers who are teaching the kids now have this beautiful school. We didn't want them to be living in slums next to this really nice school. So we're literally building 20 teachers houses around it and each house costs about $40,000. So if someone cared about either education, um, I would love for them to give to helping us build that, that school campus yeah. or they care about hunger to give to helping alleviate the hunger of that of those villages. Yeah, I love it. Well, yeah, we'll yeah. definitely set all avenue, all ad revenue from the mm -hmm. show uh, into that, and then we'll put a link in the show notes where they can donate more. Awesome. And my wife will love yeah. me so much. Yeah, there you go. Because uh, she's she's <laughs> there several times a year now and has such a passionate heart. For yeah, them. how does she get connected with that? Like, where did that come from? Uh, you know, she's been all over the world, and she was working on projects in Bangladesh and in India, um, Syria, Lebanon, uh, even Ukraine. She was there in the middle of the war. Wow. And um, but she was invited to go see what was going on in Malawi, and they went and started looking at different places in the country, found a village that was just completely overlooked because it, they didn't have enough um, mineral value or, or like geographic benefit for anyone to help them. And so she just, they just picked probably the most dire village in the whole country and yeah. said, we're gonna transform this one village. Yeah, this is gonna be our thing. Yeah. Oh, that's powerful. And it, it was pretty cool. I was there last year meeting with the, the chief because they she meets with like 40, 50 chiefs from all the villages mm. and they consider her a chief. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and she is. And, uh, and so she sits at the chief's table and, and she listens to them and they tell her what they want, what yeah. they need. And it was actually because uh, Chief Chaliza um, when they asked him, what do you want? He lives in a squalor and he could have said, I would like a new home or, and he said, please educate our children mm. so that they can have a better life than us. And that's where building this school actually was born. Yeah, that's powerful. It reminds yeah. me of the, uh, the starfish analogy. I'm sure you've heard that, mm -hmm. right? Like, sure, yeah, of course. Yeah, the little kid on the yeah. beach throwing starfish and says it matters for that one. Yeah. Uh, you know, like, you, yeah, you might say, oh, that's just small, one small village in one small country in the yeah. giant world. But to those kids, the 1600 yeah. kids was at the school, like, yeah. yeah, what a difference that makes for them. Yeah, and because of that work, that's how we've ended up, ended up meeting with the president and with the cabinet and yeah. different people in parliament. Or, and it's amazing how if you bring transformation just in one place, the light shines in that darkness. Mm. 
and uh, and um, we all talked about Jesus yeah. all over the country. It's amazing. Yeah. Okay. I got one more Jesus question for you, and then okay. we'll go into some business stuff and uh, entrepreneurship, all that good stuff. <coughs> Your kids. You have two, correct? Uh, they yeah. both seem to. They both seem to be pretty good kids. Like I mean, they're grown up now, right? But they're, yeah, they're uh, adults now. They're adults so, yeah. now. But you got two children. They're they're grown up. They love Jesus. They they. Uh, one's a singer, right, a musician, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, and then one works with you here on the podcast. Mm-hmm. I got two kids, uh, six-year-old and three-year-old, and my biggest fear in life is that they grow up not knowing Jesus. Mm-hmm. Like, what did you do right? Like, how did that, I mean, <laughs> like, what, what advice do you have for a guy like me? Like, how do I raise, and for those listening to the show that don't follow, you know, Christianity or Jesus, like, but you just have good, solid kids, like, that you did something right, right? Despite building multiple businesses, I'm sure you were busy. Mm-hmm. How did you do that, and what advice do you have? Yeah, we also have a foster daughter named Patty that we raised okay. for 12 years. Oh, cool. And um, we brought her home. One day, my wife said, go bring Patty home today. She needs a place to stay tonight, and she stayed 12 years after wow. that. Uh, put her through kindergarten, through college. Wow. And she ended up getting married and went and became a missionary in uh, Madura, Indonesia, wow. in the most militant Muslim uh, island probably in the world and and I remember when she was in high school she came home one day and said she was going to become a Muslim and Kim freaked out and went nuts and everything like that and and I sat down with her and said okay well let's let's study Islam and let's see what you need to do to become a good Muslim and yeah. I walked her through the whole process and one day she came back and said I don't I don't think I'm going to be a Muslim <laughs> and and so some of it and I tell that story is because you just can't panic yeah <laughs> you know yeah. and when Aaron was probably maybe not even 10 years old, we were driving the car and he said to me one day, Dad, I don't think I would uh, be a Christian if I was not being raised in a Christian home. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I said, why, why is that, buddy? He goes, well, I just have too many questions and doubts. Yeah. And he's 10, yeah. right? And so inside of me, I feel this turmoil, yeah. right, you know? But I just stayed super calm driving and I said, oh, doubts and questions, those are okay, I have those too. Yeah. And he goes, you do? And I go, oh, yeah, I have so many of them. Uh, you can have those and still really believe in Jesus. And he goes, hmm. I said, and they got quiet, and I said, so what do you think you're going to do? And he said, um, well, I've already met Jesus, so what can I do? <laughs> it's like that. It was almost <laughs> like a resolve of what, am, what can I do? I've met Jesus, but I have all these doubts and questions. And, yeah. and uh, Mariah and Aaron are different. Like uh, Aaron was questioning like from day one. You know, and Mariah, she has a universe of faith. Like, I think Mariah has more faith than I'll ever have in my life. Like, yeah. she just she just believes deeply. Yeah. It, it resonates with her soul at the deepest level. And, um, and they, they're different people. I just related to them differently. But I think the main thing is I like my kids. Mm. I don't just love my kids. Like, I like them. And I wanted to raise people that I liked. I thought if I have to interact with them, I want to like these people. Yeah. And you know, and and I knew that the only way they were going to see God was through me. I really believe that if they trusted me, they would trust God. If they thought I was safe, yeah, they would believe God was safe. Mm-hmm. If they felt that I listened, they would feel like God would listen. Yeah. And so my biggest advice is, um, just realize that you're the singular reflection of God in their life. Mm. And if you are like harsh and judgmental and condemning and they're never good enough and you know you get angry when they don't get an A because that makes you look bad yeah. or you know um, you, you get out of control or you lose your temper or you spank them out of anger, um, that's how they're gonna see God. Yeah. You know, if you're inconsistent uh, to what you say, to what you do. Now my kids will tell you, I don't think this is true, but that I never told them what to do. <laughs> and uh, I never told them not to drink. Yeah. I didn't tell them you know, not to do drugs. I didn't tell them all that. I just told them what to do, not what not to do. Mm. And, and when they would come to me, because of that, they were always like free to ask me about anything. And, and we, 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 we could just enjoy life and look at it from third person and go, wow, look, look what those choices are resulting in that person's life. Yeah. Is that the life you want? You know, and it was almost, uh, and they say, what do you want me to do? I said, no, I'm not going to tell you what I want you to do. I want I want to pull out of you what you feel you should do. Yeah. And, and so I would force them into a, an ethical dilemma where they had to choose for themselves. I, I felt like if I choose for them, I'll make them weaker. If I guide them toward good choices, I really believe in parental guidance. I don't yeah. think you just let your kids do whatever they sure. want to do. And, uh, but I guided them 
not with authoritarianism. I guided them with, you know, with like wisdom yeah. and, and adventure. Yeah. I took them all over the world. I wanted to make sure that uh, following Jesus was the most exciting thing in the world. Yeah. You know, and I mean, I, I, Aaron, especially because he traveled with me first, went to some of those dangerous places in the world with me. And, um, and just learn to live a life on the edge and live a life of adventure, live a life of risk and faith. And Mariah has been to over 30 countries with me around the world. And um, they never saw Jesus as something safe or boring or yeah. predictable. They saw Jesus as the epicenter of, of like creativity and artistry and innovation and risk and courage. Yeah. And that just makes it much more compelling. It reminds me of the line in uh, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, right, where the beaver is talking to the kids yeah. and they ask about Aslan, and they're like, well, is he, is he safe? And the, I don't know if it's Mrs. Beaver or Mr. Yeah. Beaver, but they're like, yeah, goodness, no, he's not safe. Yeah. You know, of course he's not safe, but he's good. Yeah. And I've always loved that line. I want that like tattooed on my body someday. Like, yeah, the, and that's the thing is I, I sit in my mind early um, if they want a boring life, they're going to have to walk away from Jesus. Mm. And uh, Jesus is going to be the most exciting space in the world. Yeah. Now, how does that reconcile with those who look at the Christian faith uh, and they're like, no, I just see stuffy people go to church on Sunday, usually judgmental, and then they go yell at the waiters at, you know, Red Robin after church. Like, how do you reconcile, like, like that, because that's not the Christian faith. That is for some people, mm -hmm. and it's not for others. So how, how do you view that? Like, how do you, how does somebody make faith more... I don't know, dangerous. Uh, yeah, I unsafe. think the reality is that we tend to look at people as segmented expressions, but there's something more integrated. Like there, there's a huge number of people who are what would be called early majority, late majority people. They're not innovators, not risk takers. Mm. They're um, they really are prone toward leaning toward safety and security and comfort. Unfortunately, American Christianity has created churches that draws those kinds of people, the yeah. church. Yeah. So when you look at the church across the board, it looks like a very safe culture. Yeah. And, and, and a part of the reason is because people who are um, really driven, passionate, intense, ambitious, they're almost pushed out of the center of the church. And so what people are seeing are, are the really safe, mm -hmm. uh, predictable, kind of boring, bland, mundane expressions of not Christianity, of life, yeah. but they happen to have God. And I think it's really important for people to do what you're doing, to be a new expression of what it means to follow Jesus, to, to be courageous, to be risk-taking, to be ambitious, to be passionate, to be creative, to be crazy. Yeah. And so that people go, oh no, that's what Christians look like. Yeah. And that for me is the only solution, is for us to live bigger. Yeah. Yeah, I've said that actually for years, is I, yeah. like my ministry, if you can call it that, is I just want people to know that you like, there are such things as not weird Christians, like not not no, like boring. Like it's okay to go and make millions of dollars trying to invest in property or you know build a side company or you know whatever. Like go do yeah. extreme sports. Like you can do that, and like you like you said earlier about being a pastor, it's okay to be both. Like mm -hmm. you can be a Christian and have a cool epic life. And I think once I give people like my thought, my theory is once I give people permission that it's okay they might look at Christianity in a different light. Yeah. And that's all I'm like, okay, I don't need to convert you and sit you down and yell at you. I'm just like, yeah, I, this is what I believe and I have a cool life and I live in Hawaii and I do surf. Like, yeah. that's cool, like you can do that. Yeah, and, and by the way, if people who love Jesus and want to live lives of integrity and want to live lives that reflect his character, if they're not those people who create billions, people are gonna be convinced that only unethical people yes, can create uh -huh. billions. Mm -hmm. And they're not gonna see the other pathway toward that kind of success. Yeah. And that's why it's so important for people who do have faith and are grounded in their faith to achieve at the highest level possible. Or we're gonna think, oh no, you can't be a world-class musician if you believe in God. Yeah. Or you can't be a world-class filmmaker if you believe in God. And, and that's part of the problem is that a lot of times it's the Christians are really comfortable with average. Yeah. That's and, so true. <laughs> you know? It's so true. And we have to press and press like and press. Christian movies. We want to yeah. be the best in the world. Yeah. You know, I mean, um, Christians should be the best communicators in yeah. the world and the best artists in the world and the best entrepreneurs in the yeah. world. There shouldn't be any domain in human society where we're not pressing to become the best there is. Yeah. Uh, I love that. Yeah, yeah I was uh, telling your team earlier, I'm, I like to make things competitive that aren't competitive. Like, <laughs> I, I see your guys' YouTube videos. I'm like, that's the standard. Like, we're going to do better than that. Like, we, like I want to be better. <laughs> and not because, like, I want to, like, show anybody up, but I'm just like, I, I want to continually strive for that greatness. Yeah. Uh, and 
if somebody else is doing something better, like you guys got some lights that we don't have, I'm like, oh, we're gonna get, well, we're gonna do that now. Which is right? like, I, I had a beard, but you know, I'm coming <laughs> on your podcast. You have a way better beard. So I just shave, might my well shave it all off. I yeah. said, I can't compete. Yeah, so I'm tapping yeah. out. Sometimes you just yeah. gotta give up, man. And that's what a lot of people do. They just, I can't compete, so I'm just tapping out. Uh, uh, that's okay. <laughs> I, I, I'll relish in that. Uh, so let's go to uh, this idea of mind shift. Is that the, that's the book, right? Uh, that that's my with? next book. Yeah. Uh, I wanna know about this. What does that even mean, mind shift, and why is that important to you? Yeah, it's, um, for me, the most exciting project that I've worked on in a long time. I mean, um, the art of communication for me was a, a breakthrough, revolutionary kind of space for me. Um, but MindShift is basically my response to the endless number of, of questions I got around the world. If you were a 26-year-old, if you were, uh, what would you say to your 26-year-old self? Mm, yeah. You ever heard that question? Yeah. Like, what would you say to your 26-year-old self? Everyone I went around the world, people would keep asking me that question. But does anyone have another question? And I realized, oh, I'm at the age now where everyone thinks I don't remember my 26-year-old <laughs> self. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and so I just sat down at first and I started asking myself that question. Mm. What would I say to my 26-year-old self? And, and at first, I was writing the book as hindsight just looking back, but I realized I can't write hindsight because I still have a huge future to yeah. create. So I'm not ready to like just write your back. memoir. Like, <laughs> yeah, I can't do it here at the end of my life. So instead what it, what it shifted to was what were the mental structures that I had to move inside of my own brain to live the life I've created mm. and, and to remove all those internal limitations. One of the things I talked about is how, uh, the whole book is about destroying internal limitations. Yeah. And I feel like that's my calling in life. Yeah. And um, because most people think that the, their outside circumstances are what li are limiting them. Yep. And it's really their internal limitations. So this book is about 12 mind shifts that we make, that we need to make to live our lives at an optimal level. Yeah. And I think it's pretty exciting. What's about an example it. of one of them? Well, I'll give you an example of the, um, okay. where I, oh, well, yeah. Um, there are two conflicting chapters. I like it. And um, one that basically says it's all about people, and the other one says uh, you, take it, you can't take everyone with you. Mm. And if you just take those two chapters and turn to one book, it would feel like yin and yang, or black and white, or you know, fire and water, because um, there's this tension that if you don't understand that people are the highest value, yeah. you're gonna burn everything in your life. I mean, I remember sitting down with these 150 guys whose companies all I guess make over 100 million a year. And, and I got up there and I said, hey, I'm not gonna tell you how to make more money, but I am gonna tell you how not to die alone. Mm. And most of those guys are on a track to die alone. Yeah. And, and a huge part of that is because they don't understand um, the economy of people and how that's the greatest value in life. But there's this other tension that you can't take everyone with you. One of the greatest challenges in my life is I have this um, really, really high empathy and it's hard for me to leave people behind. Yeah. And what I began realizing eventually in my life was that I was trying to carry so many people in the future who did not want to go with me. Yeah. And they didn't even want to go into their future. And they were um, choosing to drown in their mediocrity and they were gonna drown me with them. And I eventually had to make a really difficult choice. Do I, uh, I can't save them, yeah. and, but they can drown me. And do I cut off the line to move into a future. And it, uh, I'm using a really harsh metaphor, but I, I you know, in, um, in ocean training, when they drop helicopters to save people from ships or boats that have crashed and there's people in the water, they're taught to save the people who are swimming toward the helicopter, mm. not the people who are frantically swimming away from it. Because you, you can't save the people who don't make the choices to move toward their best future. And having been a pastor for you know 40 years you feel a moral obligation to save everyone yeah you know you feel a moral obligation to bring everyone with you and probably the greatest pain in my life and kim's life has been all the people we invested so much in mm. who eventually said hey we're out yep and we realized we just spent five years or 10 years um thinking that eventually that person would grow and they never made a choice to grow. Yeah. And then this uh, consultant once told me that um, um, one of the most dangerous things you can be is a person who tries to make someone something they don't want to become. Mm. And if, if you see someone in, 
you know, they have addictions and you yeah. want them to be clean, you, you can't make them clean. They have to want to be clean. Yeah. If you love someone and they are satisfied with mediocrity, you cannot uh, force them to want excellence. And if you want people who are trapped in their past, you can't force them to go into a future. And, and so I think one of the more challenging chapters is even the one just trying to figure out who are the people that you carry with you no matter what, and who are the people you have to leave behind no matter what. Yeah, and I that's think hard. that's one of, one of life's great tensions. Yeah, so how do you yeah. how do you do that? I mean, how do you, like let's go to the drug example, right? So there's a lot of people addicted. I mean, you work a lot of inner city stuff here. Like mm -hmm. there's drugs, are everywhere. Somebody doesn't want to, do you just leave, I mean, leave them? Mm -hmm. Do you stay at arm's length? So how do you deal with situations like that, whether it's drugs or other you know, yeah. issues? When I, I spent about 10 years working with drug cartels, mm -hmm. and people don't really know that about me that much, I but. Like we need to dig on on that. On <laughs> that. <laughs> we need to dig on on that, but okay, keep going. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, with people coming out of the, the world of gangs, yeah. um, prostitution, um, uh, people involved in the world of assassins and, yeah. and um, and one of the things uh, early on when I went to work with the urban poor, I actually was probably more of a person that believed the man was holding everybody down, mm -hmm. you know, this ethereal man. Yeah. And if the poor just had an opportunity, they would rise out of poverty. Yeah. And 10 years of just getting my butt kicked, you know, I realized, oh, I cannot give people determination, but I can give them opportunity. And what I began to distinguish was that my responsibility was to create opportunity. Their responsibility is to create determination. So I would look for people who already had determination but did not have opportunity. Uh, yeah. And when you find a person who's trapped in poverty, or a person who's trapped in addiction, or a person who's trapped in some you know, sp spiraling behavior, but they have a determination, and then you give them opportunity, they fly. And you look like you're a miracle worker. You're like, how did you change that person's life? All I did was create an opportunity. They brought the determination. So that's one of the things I look for now. And I don't, uh, I, don't I no longer feel a moral obligation to impose determination in another human being. Mm. See, if, if someone else doesn't want to succeed, I have to just accept that's, that's the life they've chosen. Yeah. And, um, and if someone else doesn't want to be free of something, I, I, I can't be more determined than them. Yeah. But when I find someone who's determined, I'll do anything to help them find the opportunity. Yeah, good buddy of yeah. mine uh, lives out in Maui. He owns a big construction company. He was just telling me this long, like the, like his strategy, all his team, his best people, his COO, like all his best people came from like out of prison mm -hmm. uh, because he would look for the people who had like chain and determination and they yeah. would never have opportunity. He gave them the opportunity and now they're thriving and the loyalty that like, like leads to, yeah. uh, it's, it was an incredible story to hear. Our campus pastor in Mexico City, Emerson, uh, Nowatney, he was in federal prison for at least five years wow. for so, trying to sell seven kilos of cocaine. He mm -hmm. should have had, I think, seven life sentences. Wow. And um, I think he was out after five years and was sent back in for two more years. Um, and when we met him, he had really, he, he, his identity was still, he was an ex-con. Yeah. And we, um, but I saw his determination. This guy was living in San Diego, driving to LA every week to volunteer with me. Wow. And, um, I saw this guy just unwilling to not be present. Yeah. Any opportunity he stepped into, any time we invited him, he was there. And, and then he was so artistic and so creative that I began giving him projects, hey, let's create this. And he would, with his own hands, design tables and chairs and, yeah. you know, and just, and even if he didn't know how, he'd figure it out. Yeah. And over time, he started a campus with my son in Venice Beach and that thing just erupted. And then he came to me and said, I, I, I want to go to Mexico City. And he, he, him and his wife and their little boy moved to Mexico City without any team. And within probably two years, had 2,000 people coming wow. uh, to their campus in Mexico City. Uh, because that guy had been through the, just the most incredible hardships in his life. And was still determined to live a different life. Mm. All he was looking for was opportunity. Yeah, you know, on a much less drastic scale, when I look at my, my I have t you know, two businesses now, uh, well, I have probably more than that, but two primary ones, a real estate one, we, are, we have almost, I don't know, call it almost a billion dollars of real estate that we own. My COO of that started as an intern. Right? He was an intern, he was 25 maybe at the time, 
and I gave him like I saw determination. He was working a full time job, yeah. and then like every break he was out there on a laptop trying to analyze deals for us for no money. <laughs> and like I gave him a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more, and now he runs the company. In fact, the other company as well, same thing, started as an intern. So now I've got these two multi you know million dollar operations that are both run by former interns that just saw opportunities. So uh, have you found that in your case as well, where a lot of your best people came from just proving themselves? Is that a, a path yeah, that we've seen? We've never hired from the outside. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so we, we only hire people people who fight their way up from yeah, the bottom. Yeah, you know? that's it. And, and it's kind of funny because for me it was reverse. <clears throat> when I started uh, McManus Studios, sorry, <clears throat> a few years ago, when I started McManus Studios years ago, um, Aaron came to work with me and I made him an intern. Yeah. And he was my lowest paid <laughs> <laughs> employee. And for years and years he would come to me and goes, Dad, how long am I gonna be an intern? Yeah. And you didn't make that guy intern, and you didn't make that guy intern, and you didn't pay that guy, dirt. Yep. And I said, yeah, I know, but you're my son. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I, I don't want anyone to ever say you started at the top. Yeah. And, and because of that, he got that grit. Yeah. He got that drive and that hustle that a lot of times um, people lack. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's always about looking for that hustle, looking for that person who does more than their ass. And, um, you know, if you do your job, you'll always have that job. Yeah. But if you do more than your job, you'll be too big for that job very quickly. Yep. And but that's what you want. You want the person who's always volunteering to do more. Yep. That person's asking, is there anything else that needs to be done? Yeah. That person will become so valuable that you'll, you know, you'll give them the company virtually yeah, yeah. because you're like, I can't do without that person yep. anymore. Yeah, and that's what happened, yeah. in, especially like I gave my COO, you know, my real estate thing, just more and more equity. Yeah. Now he'll make these ridiculous amounts of money because he just showed up and just continually draw more. Yeah, everybody that we, almost everybody I have hired internally somehow, mm -hmm. whether internship or some yeah. low level, and they rose up. So, and I think I, I tell a lot of entrepreneurs this all the time, is like, you know, there's a great quote in the, uh, that book Minority, or the movie Minority Report yeah. with uh, Tom Cruise, where he says, this one crazy guy says, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know if that's a real quote from somewhere else, but the movie says it. And I've always thought that in entrepreneurship, if you have a successful business, even moderately successful in anything, mm -hmm. you are a king to all those people who are younger, usually, that have, like, dream of entrepreneurship. Yeah. So if you can find those people, like basically bringing back the apprenticeship model mm -hmm. uh, into modern business, I think is something that's not been enough of, uh, but I'm just fascinated by it. I think that, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, right now, that. if you want to learn, you can learn. Yeah. I mean, you can get a yep. PhD course just on Instagram. Uh, yeah, go, exactly. go on <laughs> you YouTube, know? you'll figure it out. It's like, but, I'm, I'm sort of going, man, yeah. if this was available when I yeah. was, you know, 23, I think I could have changed the world by the time I was 27. Yeah. I mean, it's like, <laughs> you just have so much access. I mean, yeah. You know, back then I actually had to read books yeah. and go to libraries and, you know, I mean, it, there was no computers when I was growing up. You can't just ask chat GPT to no. tell you the answer. <laughs> you know, so I mean, I was in the library reading, you know, the books I needed, you know, and yeah. borrowing books and I didn't even have the money to buy books back then. Yeah. Now you can just grab everything. It's, it's incredible. Yeah, it's wild right now. So speaking of that, you mentioned futurist. You said, I'm a futurist. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what does that mean? Uh, I'm assuming that means you care about the future, but what does that mean to you? <laughs> Yeah, I think that um, there's been an evolution of my work from starting as a futurist to now being a mind architect, mm. where um, early on I, I, I had some good moments where I was really accurate in predicting cultural trends and movements. Mm. And so I, you know, I mean, early on before people were talking about it, I would, I would start predicting things like the elimination of the middle class mm. and the uh, economic uh, bipolarization of American society between the rich and the poor. Yeah. Now that would create a, a different kind of class system and, and cultural conflict. And um, how there would, um, 40 years ago, I was, just, I was predicting in America would move toward tribalism, toward like the far right, with yeah. like white supremacy, far left with socialism, communism. These are things I was predicting in my 20s. And, um, and, and then some of them were, you know, economic things, you know, and, um, and because I, you can't become a futurist just because you go, I am a futurist. You actually have to be really good yeah. at um, um, accessing data, information, trends, movements, and seeing the invisible interconnections and where the world is going. So I would work with universities and companies and organizations and help them understand how these factors would affect their company. Like with um, some universities, they would come to me and say, uh, we want, to produce this kind of student. Like we want to produce the best math students in yeah. the world. And, and, I, and I told him, I said, university just isn't that good. Like you, you can't produce the best math students in the world. Harvard does not produce the best business students in the world. Yeah. They recruit the best business students in the mm -hmm. world. 
And if you want to be known for having the, producing the greatest mathematicians in the world, then it's all about the entry level. It's how you recruit. So you have to convince that student in junior high and high school that your university is the one they want to go to. And so it's really about, a lot of people think it's the end game, but it's actually the beginning game that changes the end game. Mm. And so if you want to be known for producing the greatest um, musicians in the world, uh, you need to be able to track the greatest musicians in the world. And then you refine them and you get to, in a sense, build on the brand of that talent. Yeah. And so I would help universities know what, what program, what master's degree. So I helped start several masters and doctoral programs so that those degrees would draw a certain kind of student. Because the moment they see that degree, a master's in future studies, or, or um, you know, a master's in entrepreneurial leadership, or a doctorate in future you know, research, it draws a certain mind, and it pulls those people in. And so I, you know, and, and I would also help them realize there's some courses that really will have no functional value in the future. Yeah. And, uh, and um, because most students are gonna go to school and never do what they studied, right? And so if they learn how to learn, that's gonna be a critical thing. And so when I was working, and sometimes I would work with like denominations and go, um, if you don't make these changes, your domination will cease to exist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they wouldn't make the changes and they cease to exist. <laughs> and, uh, um, it's, and I began realizing that for most organizations, I didn't need to be able to see the future. Yeah. I only needed to be able to see the present because they were living so far in the past that for them the future, it was um, really just the present. Yeah. And, um, and it's, it's about clarity and it's also about um, not having preconceived expectations of what the future must be like. Mm -hmm. and, um, and most organizations have so much skin in the game that they can't see the future. And you can find so many companies that even inside of their company, the research that ended their company came out of their company. They didn't bother to trademark it because they didn't think it was possible. Someone went out and started at the company and bankrupted them. And you know, it's, it's, if you like football, I remember when I was living in Texas, there was a Southwest Conference. It was basically all Texas teams and I think Oklahoma and Arkansas. And even back then, I remember doing this research and using this as an example saying, this conference will cease to exist because they refuse to identify themselves outside of Texas. Yeah. And Oklahoma and Arkansas are not going to want to become Texas teams. Yep. And eventually that conference ceased to exist It ended. And while other conferences start swallowing up teams, and it's really, are you able to reinvent yourself? Are you able to create a perception that you are in the future rather than the past? Because people are not gonna move to something that looks like it's in the past. Yeah. It's just like with the church. If the, you know, when you look at the architecture of a church or you look at the, the, the dress code of a church or, the, or the, um, the language in a church, and then you're talking about the future. If you walk into a church where everyone's wearing clothes from the 1950s, Everyone's singing songs from the 1820s, and then you're talking about how God's the God of the future. No one's going to believe you yeah, yeah. because your your whole marketing and branding's off, <laughs> right? You know, and um, and but the, over time, what I began to realize was that as a futurist, I was trying to help organizations move in a direction. But really, what I find to be more fascinating and I'm more passionate about is helping people restructure their thinking. Mm. And that's why I kind of shifted from being a futurist to a mind architect. Because yeah. if I can change the way a leader thinks, I can change their whole organization. Yeah. And if I can change the way a husband thinks, I can change his family. Yeah. And it's where this really came to me was, um, oh wow, this was so long ago, but I can't remember the exact year. I think I was living in Dallas and I was driving uh, in my car. I was listening to something like ESPN or Sports Center, And Buster Douglas had just fought Evander Holyfield mm -hmm. and got knocked out. And uh, just before that, if you remember, Buster, uh, Buster Douglas knocked out Mike Tyson. Yep. And everyone was shocked that he, you know, this no-name guy beats the greatest fighter in the world. But then in his rematch, he's at McDonald's eating. He's at the mall. He's incredibly overweight, like 50 pounds overweight. Uh, he didn't prepare for the fight. And afterwards, they're commenting on it, and they said, why do you think Buster Douglas didn't even try? And the other guy says, you know, everybody loves Buster Douglas. They say he's a really good man. And the other guy said, yeah, he's even a person of faith. He, he's like a Christian. And, uh, and he goes, so why do you think he didn't even bother to try to defend his title? And then someone said something that haunted me. One guy said, some people are simply structured for failure. Hmm. And when he said that, I just like, it just thundered in my soul. Some people are simply structured for failure. And I stop thinking about Buster Douglas yeah. and started looking at myself going, am I structured for failure? 
Yeah. Have I accepted internal limitations that will keep me from living the life I'm created to live? Yeah. And I had to conclude that I had. There are some structures I had that were clearly there for success, but others that were actually limiting my capacity. And, um, and so I began a journey then going, I'm gonna make sure that I destroy every internal limitation. Yeah. And I have to spend my life identifying them. I've been married to my wife, Kim, for almost 40 years. And she'll tell you that, she'll even say to me, like, who are you? How did you change so much? You know, she goes, because who I married and who yeah. you are are not the same person. And I said, no, it's true. It's because that person had internal limitations that shaped me in a certain way, maybe from my upbringing or from my experiences or from trauma, whatever it was. And every time I removed another internal limitation, I changed as a human being and yeah. I grew and my capacity expanded. And, and even one of them, I remember one year, my wife and I slept on a floor because I wouldn't buy a bed because I said it was a luxury. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, that's, that's who she married. Yeah. I was like a monastic. I lived out of a paper yeah. bag. And for 10 years, I never made more than 12000 a year. I used to judge people who put decorations on their walls. I'm yeah. like, oh, heathens. Like, <laughs> that could have gone to the poor. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I was exactly, <laughs> I, that was me. Yeah. Yep. And I remember coming home one day, and I said, honey, I think that um, God's given me permission to create wealth. Mm. She goes, what? She goes, yeah, I think that God was like speaking to me and telling me, what am I doing? <laughs> Why am yeah. I living beneath my capacity? Yeah. And she goes, you have the ability to create wealth? I said, yeah, I have always had it. I just fought it. Yeah. I just thought it was wrong. It was evil. Yep. And so I was trying to be like Jesus. Yep. And and she goes, well, it'd be great if we had something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah maybe we start at a lower rung yeah, there. Yeah. Let's pay our bills and um, get a bed. And what I would find is that uh, every time I achieved a level of success, then I would get madly criticized by the Christian world, yep. and I would move into self-destructive behavior. Yeah. And I would minimize that success and actually lose it. Yeah. I would consciously take myself back to zero so that no one could accuse me of, of anything. Yeah. And eventually realized, and, and it was a huge internal structure, I need to stop living a life of obligation and live a life of intention. Mm -hmm. And I need to stop caring so much about what everyone says about me. Yeah. And it's, it's, it sounds easier than it is, yeah. especially when you're a pastor yeah. and you're, you know, you're, you're trying to represent Jesus. I didn't really care about what they said about me. Yeah. I cared about what they said about Jesus because of me. Yeah. And it felt like a massive weight on my life. And, and, and so I, I've known over this life journey that every time I changed my mind, I changed my life. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what this book is about. And that's why I think MindShift is, is really significant because it's, it's incredibly pra practical. It's just, it's gritty. It's down to earth. It's not like these ethereal formulas. It's just really simple things that get into our heads. Yep. You know. Like you, like Christians should not have wealth, or you should not have wealth, or, yeah. or that rich people are bad. You know, when I was growing up, I had a, I had a friend whose parents owned a very successful plumbing company, mm -hmm. and I judged them because they had a house cleaner, and I was like, rich people with a house <laughs> cleaner, and and for years I judged them as like the rich people who are too lazy to clean their house, and it wasn't until years later that I realized they. They weren't so rich they could afford to hire a house cleaner. They were rich because they hired a house cleaner because yeah. they had a different mindset. Yeah. Um, they had if, like, When I shifted my mind into that, I was yeah. like, oh, what if I hired people to do the lower dollar per hour tasks so mm -hmm. I could focus on higher? All of a sudden, my income went up. I'm like, yeah. oh, that was an internal limitation, yeah. not and, an external and, one. And you know, my wife uh, was an orphan. She mm -hmm. grew up in a foster home from the age of 8 to 18. She had wow. nothing. And she, her clothes were Salvation Army. Wow. Yeah. And so we, you know, we had that in the mix of our marriage and of our relationship. And, and, and I remember even that same conversation at one point where she'd say, why won't you fix the stuff around the house? Or yeah. why won't you mow the lawn? Or what, so I used to, yeah. you know, but there's several factors here. One is if I mow the lawn, I'm taking that hour to do something that if I was doing something else, I would be able to pay for a hundred people to mow yep. the lawn. Yes. Secondly, if I'm mowing the lawn, I'm taking a job from someone Mm, yeah. who their best job right now is mowing a lawn. Yeah. Now I'll give you an example this week. We're living in a, in a home and didn't have a very big yard, but um, I paid someone from El Salvador because I'm from El Salvador. And I, I, I want to help people who came from my background. Yeah. And he was mowing my lawn. One day I walked outside, he was crying. So what's going on? He said, someone just came and sold my lawnmower in my edger. And I said, 
oh, I'm so sorry. And he goes, and I just replaced them. They were stolen last month. Oh, no. So I said, okay, uh, we're going into business together today. Yeah. And, um, and I funded his company, and then I taught him how to scale his company. And, and, and then the first day he came back to mow my lawn, he said, I, I, he said, no, don't pay me. I said, no, you're my business partner. You can't afford not to be paid. <laughs> 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 no freebies, and not even for me, not for anyone. You, you know? And I remember three years later, he dropped by the house. He wasn't mowing lawns anymore. He bought a house, yep. and he had all these employees that were mowing lawns. And when we moved to a bigger house with a bigger yard, he goes, oh, I can't do that. I can't manage that. The yard's too big. And that's when I go, no, you have to learn how to scale. Yeah. You know? So you're gonna scale with us as yep. we scale. And, and I love that. And I think if we just thought in terms of everything that you don't have to do, that someone else does have to do because that's how they bring food home, yep. it's actually an incredibly ethical mm -hmm. thing to do to employ people. So my wife always employs people. I yeah. mean, you know, there are times we have you know, 15, 20 people she's paying. Yeah. And uh, because one, she becomes everybody's friend yeah. and they're all in our home and they're eating with us and they become a part of our lives. And, and, um, and, and, and for me, one day we were walking down the street and there were these two um, construction workers, clearly immigrants, with a paper bag, eating a sandwich out of it. And, uh, and I said, you know how, how people say, there by the grace of God go yeah, I? Yeah, yep. And I said, that's not my statement, that was me. Yeah. I was the guy working construction. Yeah. I was the guy eating my lunch out of a paper bag. I was the immigrant who was yeah. working the, um, you know, the, the hard physical labor job. Um, that was me. And, and now we're walking to our house yeah. and it's different. And, but because that happened for me, not only do I know it can happen for others, but I wanted to. Yeah, yeah. that's powerful. Yeah. yeah, you know, I've had a mindset coach for seven, six, seven years now, every other week we meet together. and. And people ask me all the time, like, you know, what, what do we talk about? Why do I do it? And I'm always like, I don't know, but it all, it's, it's working, right? Like some of the limitations I've had, things like I yeah. don't deserve to be wealthy. I don't deserve a little bit. When I started working with them, I was in a tiny little 800 square foot house, like in like the rainiest part of the country, up in Washington state. Mm -hmm. And like, that's where I thought I deserved to be, right? Mm -hmm. And now like, you know, I, I've got obviously a little bit different life now, but we just keep breaking through these limitations and all of a sudden I'm able to grow. And if you look at the business world, you know, there, I see like, this is a framework I'm playing with right now, but mm -hmm. uh, there's like four things that really drive a, a business to grow. If you think of a table, I like the mm -hmm. idea of a table, right? Four legs of a table. And if you want to lift the whole table up, your business right. to go, you got four legs. And the four legs, and I'm gonna give them all an M because I'm trying to be a pastor and put a framework to this, right? You got, you got money, so the company makes money or you, you know, it's profitable, you raise money, whatever, the money side of the business. You have the marketing for leads, how to get people, business, whatever. And then you have the management, all the internal, external mm -hmm. management to get it go. But like you can do those three just fine, but your table still tips over if you don't have the fourth, which is mindset. Mm -hmm. Like if you don't have the right way to think about it, your business cannot elevate and cannot yeah. grow. So like just the idea of hiring somebody to push you on the mental side of your business mm -hmm. is one of the greatest investments I've ever made. So I'm excited about your book. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah, you know, one of the things I found, I think on two sides, one is that when people are um, like uber successful, like, you know, in the billions, yeah. um, they're really bored yeah. <laughs> a yeah. lot of times. And um, one of the things I discovered by accident was they just like access to good thinking. Yeah. And I realized, oh wow, I, I actually have a commodity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and which was, was one side of the table, but the other side of it is that um, there is never a place where people no longer have challenges. Yeah. Like no matter how wealthy people are, no matter how successful they are, they're still fighting stuff. Yeah. You know, I, I remember years ago, I was in New York with um, a woman whose company was at, at a few billion. And, um, and she, I, she asked me to come in and, and give her a day to consult with her. And, and it's never just a day, but you know, yeah. it always starts like, it starts like an hour and then it goes yeah, yeah. on forever, right? You know? and, and I remember she was walking me through all these different things, that this project and this project and this project and this project. And she goes, I just can't seem to finish any of them. And, and if, with each one of those projects, she had a friend that she kind of was helping and a friend she was doing it with and a friend she was doing it with. And, and, uh, and I said, I, I know you're not a football player, but it seems to me like you get everything to the one yard line and never score a touchdown. Mm. And she goes, yes. And, and I said, well, I, I know why that is. And, and she goes, well, tell me why, because that's what I've been trying for for the past, you know, multiple years. And I said, and I said oh, I'll be right back. I, I said, I gotta, I gotta take a break. I came back and, and I said, 
I want you to know that even though we've been meeting for half a day, I've known this f from the first five minutes. And she goes, why, why can't I score? And I said, because you don't really care about any of those things. Mm. You only care about those people. None of those projects matter to you. Yeah. And so if you actually score a touchdown, you'll lose the people because they'll succeed and you don't, they don't need you anymore. Mm. And, uh, and then she started cussing at me <laughs> <laughs> and said, you knew this the whole time? And I said, yeah. She goes, I don't like people playing with me. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, no, actually, um, it took me one minute to know the solution. It took me six hours to get you to be able to hear it. Mm. And, and that's the challenge is that when you're working as a mindset coach, it's you a lot of times actually know yeah, yeah. right away. Because yep. you've been doing this so long. Yeah. It just it takes a while to get people yeah. to the place where they can hear it. Yeah, you would have walked in and said that right away. She would have, yeah, okay, thanks, get out of my yeah. office. Yeah, I don't, yeah. Yeah, you, you have to like move all the pieces on the table, yeah. right, you know? And no, I, I, I agree, I mean, I, but I think kind of think it does start there. It starts with the mindset yeah, leg of the table, right, yeah. you know? And um, because you have to decide that you want to do something that matters. Yeah. And, and I, I'm not really, I've never been one of those people like, I'm just not driven by money. Yeah. Like, it, it, you know, it's, it's and, and I know people who make money who are driven by money. They, yeah. they, it's just, it's what fuels them, yeah. you know? I, I, I love freedom. Yeah. I, I was thinking this morning that I think probably my, like my optimal reward for the work I do is I get to live the life I want. Yeah. I get to choose what I do during the day. I get to, you know, um, I get to have such immense freedom. I, I've been to 70 countries around the world. I love to travel. I get yeah. to meet new people. Um, and I, and I, I felt guilty for living this life. And then the other side of me is I've worked really hard for this life. Yeah. You know, and so the only way I think I can alleviate some of that guilt is try to help as many people as possible live the life they long to live. Yeah, I, I have a friend, and I that I was talking to about a week ago. He's in my house, and and he asked me, "Hey, uh, what do you see in me? You know, what could I be doing to scale? What could I be doing to maybe do more?" And he's one of the kindest people I know. I really love this guy. I enjoy him tremendously, and I just said, "You know, you've never asked me." You know, I've been your friend for a long time, and I've never, I never imposed my, my views on another person, you know. I said, you're the kindest person in the world. You're just not dangerous. <laughs> he goes, what? How do you take that? <laughs> yeah. And I, and I, and I you know, kind of tapped him on the chest, and I said, I just always wanted you to be a little bit more dangerous. Mm. I just wish you would take some risk and yeah. be a little more fearless and, yeah. and fail somewhere, yeah. you know, lose something, you know. I said, but you're, you have a great life. You have, you're a great husband, great dad, and you've, built a great family yeah. you know um, I won't I'm only answering this because you asked me so you have to decide is the life you have enough and if it is then celebrate it yeah you know and then if you feel like you're created to do more then we'll talk some more yeah and he's been texting me going maybe I'm just designed just to do this yeah you know and and I, and I said your problem is that you're a great employee yeah you have a real skill that people want to pay for I said, I didn't have a skill people wanted to pay for. <laughs> <laughs> I was a terrible employee. So I needed to create yeah. my own universe. Yeah. Like, you know, and I said, you have a great skill, so your boss will love for you to always give him your life. Yeah. To give him that skill, and he'll pay you for that. Yeah. Or you could figure out how to start a company around that skill. I just try to help people go, if I'm a great employee, one day, I can jettison and be the great employer. Yeah. You know, nothing, nothing wrong with being a great employee. Yeah. I need great employees yeah. and you do too. Yeah. We all do, you know, but I do hope for most people eventually, if that job gives them the freedom they long for, yeah. then keep that job. Yep. It, it, you know, if that's creating the life, you're going, wow, I get to surf every morning, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, yeah, I'm working 60 hours a week for this guy and I'm making this much money, but it's really the amount of money I need to live the life I want. Yeah. Enjoy that. It's, it's not about comparison. It's not about, you know, being better than another person. It's really optimally living the life you long to live and that you're created to live. Yeah. 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 You know, that's one of the, the mindset shifts I had to go through was you, you mentioned earlier, like there's a little bit of guilt, right? Like living an, ep like an epic life, we'll call it yeah. that, right? Or a great life, traveling or, or building cool things, right? Yeah. But I, I heard this quote years ago and I'm going to butcher it, but basically like nobody's served by you living a small life. Right, like, like, so when I can live, in fact, the fact that I live in Hawaii, uh, I would have never occurred that that's a thing, right? Except for I was at a kid's birthday party and this guy I'm sitting next to is like, yeah, I just moved to Hawaii a couple years ago. And I was like, what do you mean you moved to Hawaii? Like people don't move to Hawaii. He's like, yeah, I just got a shipping container, put everything in it. And 
shipped it over. It was like 10 grand and it blew my mind. So mm-hmm. his ability to live a, a bigger life, like for him, yeah. gave me permission to start thinking that way. And a year later, I'm living in Hawaii. And so sometimes like the things that we do, like we're feeling that guilt of like, well, should I really do this thing? Or even like, I mean, obviously you'd be careful about like posting on social media, but sometimes like our, when we do great things, it inspires other people to do great for themselves. Yeah, yeah it's funny. I have a friend who <clears throat> does some of the similar stuff, but um, he's always posting about his airplane, yeah. his yeah. Lamborghini, yeah. And, you know, his houses. Yeah. And houses and houses yes. and houses and 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 I love him. I mean, yeah. he, he's great. And one day, you know, I think he was just feeling like he needed to justify it, you, yeah, yeah. you know. But I wasn't asking him to. Like I was just, <laughs> I was just celebrating him, going, um, "I'm, you know, I'm calling you from airplane. I go, love your airplane. Yeah. Like that's all I yeah. do. Like you yeah. know, you know, take me on a ride one day. Yeah, you know? yeah you know? exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And and when he goes, well, you know, I have to have this house because uh, it's where I bring people and. It's, because I need to live an aspirational life. Mm. And I remember one day saying to him, you know, it's crazy. I think if I own nothing, my life would still be aspirational. Yeah. And I, I think that's the goal mm-hmm. is to live a life that's aspirational, having nothing. Yeah. And then adding to that because you can. Yeah. You, you know, and because it's not the wealth that makes your life aspirational Correct, it's the yeah. courage yeah <laughs> you know it's yeah. it's the faith it's like it's it's not the stuff it's the adventure that you went on yeah you know it's it's that whole journey and that process that um that created that yeah i've told people look fame wealth power prestige they're like really great outcomes they're just terrible life goals mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know and uh if if your life goals are you know integrity compassion, kindness, generosity, um, and those things all become an outcome, it's gonna be a beautiful thing. And I think the problem sometimes that people lose their purpose because they lose their stuff, because their stuff was their purpose. If you if your purpose is your career or your job or your house or your Mm -hmm. you know your company and you lose that, then you've lost your meaning. Yeah. But if your meaning is the person you're becoming, no one can steal that from you. Yeah. I mean how many people do you know who've sold I know a lot of them, I'm sure you do, sold their company. Yeah. tens of millions, hundreds of millions yeah. of dollars. And all of a sudden they're just lost for years. They're just like, what do I do? Like I was the CEO of a massive company and it's like, they can't find that identity because their identity was that business. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, uh, it's sad. It's something I want to always prevent. Like I'm not the real estate guy. I'm not the <laughs> the podcast guy. I'm not the author. I am like, I'm Brandon. Like mm-hmm. this is like, I'm, I'm a dad. I got a good wife. Like yeah. I'm, I like adventure. Like, yeah, that, that you can't take from me. Right. Like, yeah. yeah. yeah it's funny. One of my friends called me, uh, uh, to give him some counsel on his company, and um, he was gonna have a pretty nice buyout. He said, "If you know, if I sell my company, I'll, I'll, I'll clear about sixty-eight million, which yeah. is you know yeah. pretty good." Yeah, it's and, a good, uh, good Tuesday morning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he he said, um, "You know, I'm just not sure if I should sell right now yeah. or if I shouldn't, but I feel like maybe I should because I'm having these tensions in my life." And and I said, "Well, okay, let's paint a picture of the life you could create if you had all that money, yeah. and the life he could create." was the life he would have if he had the company. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said, so in other words, if you were completely free, yeah. you would be running your company because yes. you love it. Yeah. And, uh, and he goes, yeah. And I said, so why would you sell your company to give it the very thing that's giving you all your pleasure and yeah. joy and meaning in life? He goes, well, yeah, but I got these other tensions. I go, okay, so why don't you fix those? Yeah, let's fix that problem. Yeah. yeah like, and, and I think a lot yeah. of times people, it's a self-destructive personality of, like, of a super athlete. Yeah where of a John Morant, right? You're going, this guy has all this money and all this, you know, talent. He's a great basketball player. Why would he like flash a gun on a video yeah. and, you know, and at a club, it, it's almost like he, he doesn't know how to handle all the success. Yeah. And, it, and, it, and I think a lot of people make self-destructive choices yeah. because they don't want to say, I can't handle the success. Yep. So they make this choice to jeopardize the success. Mm-hmm. I agree. And I'm going, no, no, let's create the, the psychological infrastructure yeah. so you can handle more success rather than destroying your life. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there have been quite a few times along the way in my life where I thought, I don't know if I can take this. Yeah. I mean, I've had moments where I just thought, I don't know if I can take the, the abuse. I don't know if I can take all the criticism. I don't know if I can take all the hate. Yeah. And because uh, I'm a fairly public person. Yeah. And my life is like, everywhere i mean wikipedia does nothing but lie about me like there's no truth on that thing yeah. like you know and i'm going you know can i live this and 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 i had to realize that i was having to fight some self-destructive tendencies and go 
I just want to blow my life up. Mm. And it's not even because I like anything that would blow it up. It's yep. just I just I'm not handling the pressure of this. Yeah. And and fortunately, I've been able to at each time make the psychological and spiritual shifts and go, okay, Jesus isn't saying any of these things about me. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, because I actually really do believe in Jesus, and I'm yeah. going, you know, he's like really good with me. Yeah. And uh, and even when I'm doing bad, he's good with me because he chose me when I was doing terrible. Yeah. <laughs> so I can't really upgrade his affection for me. Yeah. And and I've had to really learn how to create that that perimeter of input yeah. in my life. And uh, and I think it's why now I'm 64, been married 40 years, have great kids, and and starting another career. Yeah. You know, and every 10 years of my life, by the way, I've started a new career. Mm. And uh, when I became a writer. Uh, my first book uh, won an award. You know, I, I, when we had our fashion company, uh, one of our fashion uh, lines won an, uh, the Ecodomani Award in the first year. We, you know, when we did commercials, our first commercial came out number one ad rate for the Super Bowl. Wow. Like each time we moved into a new career, we broke new ground, and people thought it was crazy. And and it's because I dreamed about it for a long time. Yeah. I turned it into a hobby, then started playing with it until I realized somebody would pay me and then I end up turning it to career yeah. and that's why you know in this journey I go I'm not done if I live three more decades I'll have three more careers mm. yeah. and because every 10 years I want to challenge myself I want to keep expanding what keep growing I want to keep destroying more of those limitations there was a great episode of the Derek, uh, Derek Sivers was on Tim Ferriss's podcast maybe a, I'm mm. gonna, probably a decade ago it was a forever ago but mm. he tells the story and I still remember it is like He's like, there's a donkey in the middle. He's a starving and thirsty donkey, right? And he, on the left is water, on the right is food. And so he looks to his left, and he looks to his right, looks to his left, looks to his right, and then eventually falls over dead because he can't make a decision. And he <laughs> uses that, he, and, he, and he turns it to the idea that people oftentimes are stuck in this, what do I do with my life? Do I do? And he brings us this amazing mindset shift for me. And like, that's why mm -hmm. I still remember it. He said, you can do a different thing every decade and have like nine lives, like yeah. nine different careers, and do an entire, I mean a decade is a long time, so I love yeah. that you brought up decade, because when I look yeah. at my life, yeah, I my life has operated in decades. I mean, like, mm -hmm. I'm still a fairly young guy, but from 20 to 30, it was my wife and I grinding, buying little rental properties. And then from about 27 to 37 was me like building this real estate podcast that I was on. And now mm -hmm. I'm in this new decade, and I'm like, <laughs> for the next 10 years, I'm gonna do this better mm -hmm. life thing, because this is super cool, and this is where my passion is. So it's okay to have multiple things and not try to cram it all in at one time. Oh, oh yeah, then yeah. it doesn't work. Yeah, I think that you can live a lot of lives in one lifetime. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And enjoy it the whole time. Yeah, and so if yeah. we remember, especially us, like you know, we will likely live a lot longer than our parents. Like the mm -hmm. technological advances will mm -hmm. probably, you know, so maybe I'll live to I don't know 120. My kids might live to 140. Who knows, right? Mm -hmm. Like you know, we can hope. But like mm -hmm. we have long lives ahead of us. We'll probably mm -hmm. be healthier. I'm hoping at the end of our life also than like earlier generations who by 50, they were already like, you know, too sick and overweight to do anything. Yeah. So hopefully I'll be healthy till 90. So we'll have a long life. It, it yeah. gives a lot of, uh, reduces a lot of the stress of having to do everything. Yeah, I, I can tell you this at, at my stage of life yeah. here at 64, that two of the things that are, are really important for me are one is mental agility. Yeah, yeah. And the other one is mental toughness. Yep. And with uh, mental agility is to stay curious, to keep learning, to keep growing, to not feel as if, um, you've already hit some pinnacle yeah. of knowledge or learning or insight. And I'm more curious now than ever been in my whole life. Mm. And I feel like I'm learning more and I feel like a novice. I feel like, yeah. I'm, I feel like I'm just starting yep. and I, in my life. I'm so excited. The other part of it though is mental toughness. It's um, going back and, and sometimes fighting fights you, you had fought before and won, but then you, you kind of lost ground. Yeah. Um, like I told my wife at 65 uh, this August, I want to be in the best physical shape of my life. Mm -hmm. And um, and it's hard. I mean, I've I've torn things and broken things on every part of my body. Yeah. And I mean, from, you know, torn Achilles to, you know, brain damage to broken jaw to, you know, just everything. And so every, and, and remember the last time I, I, I think I tore my hamstring and I thought to myself, I don't know if I can recover from this. Mm -hmm. Like I literally had an internal challenge of going, I think this is the one that, that brings me down. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I was playing basketball up to the time of 63, wow. and I haven't played in the last year, just re, um, rehabbing my body. And I came to a certain point, at first it was like, oh, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. And then I had something happened to my eyes, and my eyes kind of exploded, and I can't Ooh. see as clearly. And I was playing pickleball with this guy that's never beat me, and it just, my eyes actually had this trauma 
uh, that week, and I didn't tell him, and he beat me three games in a row, and he's like so excited. <laughs> and and I remember after the first game and I lost, I thought to myself, oh, I can't see. And then by the second game, I thought to myself, I think I'm not gonna play pickleball anymore. I think that, mm. I, or paddle tennis, I don't think I can win anymore. Then by the third game, which I lost as well, I told myself, this is a new challenge. Mm. I'm gonna learn how to see with this deficiency. I'm gonna learn how to win and I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna beat them all. Mm. And, and I actually felt myself going through these, but it wasn't like a, a loss, a draw and a win. It was three losses. The only thing that changed were my internal frameworks. And, uh, and so then I just started, I went rejoined, I joined this gym, I got myself in there, I've been in there all the time. I'm like, you know, I'm doing everything I can physically to get myself back in shape. I'm, and I'm, you know, going with a specialist to get myself healed. You just have to be tough enough to endure the pain. Yeah. And, and that's something early on I learned in my life was that um, uh, if I can see pain as, as, a, as a threshold between average to greatness, um, it will change my life. Mm. And most people see pain as the threshold of their capacity. Uh, I see pain as the threshold of my mediocrity. Mm. And, and those two things as you grow older, mental agility and mental toughness, will carry you for decades. Mm, that's powerful, man. Yeah. All right, well, I want to mo start moving us towards the end here, and oh, I'm going to okay. shift to this last segment, inspired by actually a mutual friend of ours, Lewis Howe. So Lewis, <laughs> uh, he's really good at asking these questions. And, and like when we've ever hung, when we hang out, he'll say something. Instead of saying, hey, what's the best food for lunch today we can go eat? He'll say, what are the three best things you like in Maui? He always asks mm -hmm. this three question. I'm like, why does he do that? And it's because, <laughs> like, I, I, I don't know why he does that, but it, it works actually really well. So I'm going to throw that at you. I got a couple of three questions to ask you. First of all, what are three things you've done in the past, we'll call it year, uh, that has given you a better life? Could be a new habit, new action, a new mindset, a new something that you've implemented in the last 12 months, three things that have improved your life. I think one of the things I've done is um, I've surrounded myself with the highest caliber of people that I've ever been around in, with in my life. Mm. And um, I just gave myself permission to have friendships with people who want to be my friends that I never gave myself permission to. Yeah. You know, and so, you know, I'm friends with guys like Lewis and yeah. guys like John Gordon and guys yeah. like Ed Milet and yeah. guys like Jamie, uh, Paulo and Jamie Lima, yeah. you know, both as a couple of their powerhouses. And, and, and I know it sounds weird, but it, you have to give yourself permission mm -hmm. to realize, like someone called me, a guy named Edwin Ariave, he's a wonderful guy. He said, my let's been trying to contact you for years, but you just haven't responded. Would you give him 30 minutes? And I realized I'm spending so much of my life trying to help everyone who's drowning that I'm missing opportunities with people who are really thriving. Yeah. And uh, being around them changes me. Yeah. It and just, the multiply, multiplier yeah. effect, right? Like you, if you can help Ed, who goes on his podcast and yeah. broadcast it to millions, like, yeah. yeah, what an impact you can help make versus a one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, and so when I did his podcast, he said it went out to like six million people. Yeah, it's just crazy. It's when he kind of came out with his faith, and yep. it was like a beautiful thing. And we've been friends ever since. And 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 I feel a little greedy. I started these two masterminds, and they're really with just people I love to hang yeah, out with, yeah. you know. Oh, I and, didn't, I didn't and they all thing. just joined <laughs> in. And I said, "Wow, well, I get to spend time with these guys. It's yep. kind of incredible." That's one thing I think I just gave myself permission to um, have friends of the highest caliber in the world. Yeah, and. Um, I think a, um, a second thing is I've consecrated a lot more time um, to focus on keeping myself well. Mm. Uh, I'm such a driven person. And uh, I mean, I think last night I had um, one minute of deep sleep. <laughs> and uh, I've been averaging about seven to eight minutes. Oh. And so um, I've always had a sleep kind of disorder, but it's just a lot of it, my mind won't stop and I'm driving and I'm thinking and I'm creating. And so I'm just giving myself time, permission. I, I go into uh, this little gym where no one knows me, yeah. and I listen to books. And so, you know, the last few weeks I've been listening to uh, Mindset by Carol Dweck, yep. and uh, listen to Ed's book, yeah. uh, The Power One More, and John's book, Training Camp, and uh, Patrick Oconey was also a friend um, on um, Six Kinds of Geniuses. And I've just been, so I, go, I get to do multiple things. I'm in this gym, I'm working out, I'm by myself, which I need, time yeah. alone I'm learning I'm listening to books and um, and, I, and I'm restoring myself 
So that's the thing. I'm just giving myself permission. I'm not being greedy by spending a couple hours a day yeah. on my own physical and personal health. Yep. And, and you know, I, I'm trying to think what the third thing might be. That's why Lewis does the three things, right? Because yeah. the first one's usually easy. The second one's a little harder. And the third yeah. one's like, I just oh, don't I want to, I don't want it to be boring, <laughs> exactly. you, you know? And, um, <laughs> but, um, cause you know, cause there's a whole thing around health, like, you know, eating right. And yeah. you know, why somebody told me, Hey, if you'll walk 10,000 steps every day, the fat will melt off. So yeah. I'm, I'm believing <laughs> them. They're my guru right there now. You. And, uh, and trying to do that. Yeah. Same. Um, yeah. What do you got right now? I'm at, uh, I'm going to find out. I'm not doing well. 2000 <laughs> steps today. Oh, it's bad. But I think the biggest thing I've done this year that has been most significant is I have given myself permission to go public about what I do. Mm. I've always just yeah. been so private about working with business leaders and entrepreneurs and coaching people and doing my private work in the business sector. I've, I don't know why, but I've always felt like I just need to not let anybody know. And yeah. I, you know, no one knows who I've coached over years and years yeah. and years. And, and, um, and so I gave myself permission this year. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go public. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna live in this space. My wife sees me and she goes, you're so happy when you're mentoring top tier leaders. Yeah. Yeah. She goes, that's where you're like, you're alive. It's just like when I, honestly, when I design clothes, my daughter will go, you're never happier than when you're designing, creating yeah. something. And I'm giving myself permission to things that I really just, that make me happy and I love. Yeah. And um, yeah, and I think it gives me more to bring to our community at Mosaic because yeah. I'm more fully alive. Totally agree. Yeah. Yeah, see that was, see Lewis has a thing, right? Yeah, the three thing. Go. All right, second set of three questions. Uh, three books that have impacted your life. Yeah, the first one's kind of obscure. It's by a writer named Robert Heinlein. He wrote a book called Glory Road. I'm not necessarily recommending it to everyone, but um, I read it when I was maybe eight years old, and it's probably more of a post-college level yeah. book, but um, it exploded in my mind the possibilities of the impossible. Mm. And um, it's, it's about a, a guy, a Scar, who reads an ad in a newspaper that says, um, hero for hire, uh, they, they need to hire a hero, and he responds to the ad. And I think from the age of eight, I always believed there was a hero inside of each person waiting to be awakened. And, that book um, takes them into another dimension, to another universes, and and there are things in it that are very metaphysical, like he has to kill this org that cannot be killed, and so he shoves its feet into its mouth, and he keeps rolling it in, and it disappears because it eats itself. And, mm. and, and the reason I bring that up is because uh, I think the greatest talent I have is my imagination. Yeah. And uh, that, that somewhere is maybe if I have any creative genius, it's in that space. That book seeded my mind to believe the impossible and and then um <clears throat> uh, man search for meaning yeah uh was it might be the second book um um it was originally called from death camps to um concentration camps really yeah and uh because that's where you know he began his journey and um and that book, I think, has real significance to me because a person who went through the greatest level of pain and suffering discovered that you could live if you had a reason to live, yeah. if there was meaning uh, to your existence, you know. And um, and that, um, so that would be maybe the second book that has been the most significant book in my life. And um, and I, you know, while well, being too cliche, actually, <laughs> the Bible sure. is the third book. Um, when I became a person of faith in college, I didn't know why I should believe the Bible. Yeah. Like, I'm like, why do people follow this book? And it's kind of weird. And, you know, I didn't know if I, how you could validate what it said about God, because it's a very hard book to, you know, to bring. How do you validate whether something about God is true or not? Mm. And so what I did is I studied the Bible as an anthropology. And I said, if the Bible is accurate about humanity, then I can trust it's accurate about God. Mm. And I don't, know, I don't know if there's a book that has ever been written that more powerfully dissects the human yeah. psyche, the human spirit, and who we are and why we do what we do. And, uh, and frankly, like in this mastermind that I'm starting in May, all I'm going to do is take them through a biblical anthropology yeah. and help them understand who we are as human beings. And, and it's funny to me when people, I've been at different experiences, different events, people think, oh, what you've said is just like genius. And I'm like, Actually, all I've done is <laughs> is pulled this out of the Bible yep. and and applied it in a way that's real and true, and so those are the three books I think that 
stand out to me right now. Yeah, that's awesome, yeah. man. Awesome. Yeah, my uh, my buddy Alex here, who's our you know kind of producer, has been talking. Mm-hmm. We've been talking a lot lately. How there's a million business books out there, personal development mm-hmm. books, all these books, and they're great. There's some mm-hmm. great advice out there, but almost every single lesson from every single one can be distilled down to a lesson that's taught in the Bible. Yeah. Because like you know, all all truth is God's truth. Yeah, of course. Right. So like, yeah. I love that idea of like we can back that up and say, well, does this line up with Scripture? Probably. Yeah. It's probably good advice. All right. Well, final question: Where do people? Where do you want people to most follow you? Uh, online, internet, besides coming to your church. You know, where, where do people follow you and uh, get to know you more? Oh, that's a great question. And I don't actually know because I am the worst <laughs> uh, sales and marketing. Uh, I guess I'm actually probably good at branding. Yeah, I think so. And, uh, but, um, oh, so this is where you go. All right. Because they just wrote this down for nice. me. Nice, all right. All right, go to erwinmcmanus.com. Okay. Uh, they're building that out. We're just centralizing everything there yeah. uh, because we do a lot of work with the seven frequencies of communication and teach people how to become like top tier communicators. And, and then we're doing stuff with the masterminds and coaching and we just, let's just bring it all under erwinmcmanus.com and we're working at it there. There you go. Yeah. All right, well, thank you, man. This has been phenomenal, better than I could have expected. So oh man, you. so much fun. Yeah. I do have to envy that beard. <laughs> but then again, it, we'll it, get you there, man. You're an aspirational you person. I'll be working <laughs> on it. All right, thank you thank so much, you. Brandon.